saying, I must say, I admire your commitment. I thought you'd all be absent today with, uh, I, I believe there's a certain sporting event going on today. Um, I don't know what it is, mind you, but, and uh, I'm sure I'd be the most popular guy at Merlin Rise if I just got up and sat down and closed the service now. <laughs> For all your footballing fans, but we're here to worship the Lord and get into his word. I hope you're excited about that. <laughs> I'm sure if uh, I advertise this uh, message this morning about sin and repentance, I wouldn't fill the auditorium <laughs> because it's a difficult subject at times. But you know what? The more you look into it, it's a blessing. And I hope you'll be blessed by the word this morning. I'm reading from Psalm 51, as you can see. It, my title is Creating Me a Clean Heart, the Prayer of a believer, the prayer of a be the believer. So let me read. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict, and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face, face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. And you, who are God, my Savior, and my tongue, will sing of your righteousness. Open up my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that today we will grow one step forward in our understanding of who you are, the Father, heart of God, your holiness, your desire for us to be like your son, Jesus Christ. So help me, help everyone to understand your word this morning. Holy Spirit, quicken it to us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I read a story recently <clears throat> as I was preparing for this. It goes something like this. A man visited his pastor, and as he came into his office, he said, I'm so afraid. The man was a military captain, a man of great stature, yet he looked crushed as he confessed to a string of adulterous affairs and was trying to figure out how to tell his wife. The man said, I've flown over 60 missions in enemy, enemy territory. I've been in firefights and had missiles shot at me. But all that seems so much easier than telling my wife what I've done. I think we can all agree the fear of confessing our sin can be crippling, irrespective 
to the degree of sin, whether it's small or large. However, I believe as we look at this wonderful psalm, we will see there is always a way back to the Father's heart through repentance. The psalm helped me in my early days as a Christian to grasp how high, how deep, and how wide is the love of Christ towards a genuine, repentant heart. I used to listen, and still do, to a song by Keith Green. Anybody heard of the the late, great Keith Green? Probably not, but I'd recommend you listen to him. The song was, Create in Me a Clean Heart, based on Psalm 51. The words just came alive and helped me realize it doesn't matter what height I fall from, Christ's boundless love is always there to catch me. The same is true for all of us. Psalm 51 was written by David after Nathan the prophet had confronted him on his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah. So this is no small deal. (laughs) It's a prayer of repentance, as I said, and it's leading up to our week of prayer. That's why we're looking at these topics. In this prayer, there is no hint of self-justification or blame shifting in defense of his actions. Benjamin Franklin once said, never ruin an apology with an excuse. David is not making excuses yet. Bathsheba and Uriah may be the victims of David's sin, but ultimately David has sinned against the Lord. Against the Lord. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, he cries. He is appealing to God's unfailing love. Have mercy. Have mercy, O God, according to your unfailing love. After all, here is a man who has tasted the goodness of the Lord in his life. He knows the love of God through experience, through great victories and blessings in in his life. He has lived in deep communion with the Lord and know, and now he feels completely lost, broken, possibly abandoned, and maybe fearful. Someone once said that we don't realize God is all we need until God is all we have left. Here is a broken man and crushed by the weight of his sin. He knows God is all he has left, and only God can free him from the weight of guilt and shame that is his and that's weighing him down, that's been inflicted on him. Have you ever been in that situation? Not to the degree that David is here, but I'm sure in many ways we can relate to it. David is not hiding like Adam and Eve who try to hide their sin and guilt. In fact, he's honestly exposing his guilt and shame filled heart. He prays, my sin is always against me. Lord, you are right when you speak and justified when you judge. I was sinful from birth. God, your truth is truth. David prayer goes on, cleanse me, clean me, give me a new heart. That's his heart's cry. David knows that God looks at the heart, not the outward appearance. No one can fool God. We just fool ourselves when we pretend. This reminds me of the mother who had an unruly child who would not sit quietly for five minutes while she did a work call. The child kept running around, and in the end, in frustration, the mom said, sit down. So the child sat down. And as the child sat down, he looked at his mom and said, I may be sitting down on the outside, but on the inside I'm standing up. (laughs) We can all put on an outward appearance, can't we, to the Lord, but he sees our hearts. We can fake it with other people, but not with God. Do you and I, inwardly, metaphorically speaking, stand up at times when the Lord is saying, don't do it, (laughs) sit down. (laughs) Only a new heart will transform David and set him free from the pain of sin in his life. In repentance, we bring our broken hearts to the Lord. And listen to this. Repentance is 
primarily about who you are running. Not, sorry, let me read this again. Repentance is primarily about what you are running from, but you are running to. Oh, I don't think that makes sense. Uh, anyway, run to God. Isaiah 30 to 15 says, This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. So basically, the object of our broken heart is always God. We run to him. David's strength has always been in his faith and confidence and uh, worshipful obedience towards the Lord. God sees David's penitent heart and restores him through his unfailing love. And it is this love that brought Jesus into the world to rescue us all. Acts 13 says, From this man's descendants, David, God has brought a saviour to Israel, the saviour Jesus, as he promised. So isn't that amazing? Out of the line of David came Jesus Christ. So what can we take away from this beautiful psalm? First, it's important to understand the, uh, what biblical repentance means. It literally means the act of changing one's mind. A great way of visualizing is, is that you are heading in one di direction, then all of a sudden you go in the opposite direction. It's a 180 degree turn. It's a complete turning away from sin. It's simple, isn't it? But maybe not so simple. And repentance is a major theme throughout the Bible. The golden rule of any message. Let the Bible interpret scripture, isn't it? Joel 12, uh, 12 to 13 reads, Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Jesus commanded the disciples to preach the gospel of repentance. Luke 24 tells us, Repentance and forgiveness will be preached in his name. Then again, James 4, 8, Passion Version. Move your heart closer and closer to God, and he will come even closer to you. But make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners, and keep your heart pure and stop doubting. And Revelation, speaking to the church at Ephesus. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you first did. If you do not repent, I will remove your lampstand from its place. And we all know the Lord's Prayer. We looked at it a couple of weeks ago. Jesus taught the disciples in the Lord's Prayer to ask forgiveness of sins daily. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, against us. Repentance, as we can see, is not a one-off event. And maybe, just maybe, charismatic Pentecostal churches have sold us something that is not a truth. In many ways, you know, one prayer and done. You're okay now. You can carry on with your life. Nothing changes. But that's not what the Bible says. It's not what the Bible says. And the other question is, why is it, are we so fearful at times to repent our sins? Like that captain, although it was huge, you know, it, what he was going through. But I think we do fear sometimes to come clean. Repentance for me is like a life jacket. You don't reject it if you're drowning because it keeps you safe and secure in the abiding love of the Father. And Wayne Grudem, theologian, says it wonderfully. It is important to realize that faith and repentance are not confined to the beginning of the Christian life. They are rather attitudes of the heart. Attitudes of the heart that continue throughout our lives as Christians. Throughout our lives. So what are the things we can learn or take away from this psalm that will help us in our prayer and devotional life? Number one, 
an unrepentant heart blocks our worship and relationship with the holy God. As we read, David cried out, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise and restore to me the joy in praise, I assume, of my salvation. David's sin prevented him from being open in his worship. In fact, it had silenced him. Lord, open my lips, he cries. In John's Gospel, the fourth chapter, Jesus says, Yet a time is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit. And what? In truth. In truth. Truth keeps worship alive and full of the joy of the Holy Spirit. Have you noticed that there's nothing so sad and miserable as a backslidden Christian? Because they've walked away from the truth, and yet they know the truth. But thankfully, like the prodigal, the father is waiting, looking over the horizon for those who have drifted away to come back to him. His heart is always there for the repentant sinner to come back to him. David is able to worship again by God's grace. His repentance becomes an act of worship. And that, when I study this, I realize that repentance is an act of our worship. Do you get that? I think that's one of the keys. It's an act of our worship. None of us should fear the act of repentance. We can learn from David and make it part of our worship to the Lord. Number two, an unrepentant heart quenches the Holy Spirit in our lives. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, we are warned not to quench the Holy Spirit and to reject, reject every kind of evil. King David feared he would go the way of Saul, who lost the presence of God in his life. Do not cast me away from your presence and don't take my Holy Spirit from me. I'm praying I'm sure like many of you, for revival. My greatest desire at this time, being Welsh, is a move of the Holy Spirit and a tangible presence of God in our services, in our ministries and in our communities. And I know there's many in this congregation who feel exactly the same way. Amen. It is the presence of God through the Holy Spirit that radically changes lives brings deliverance, heals the sick, sets the captives free from sin, depression, and anxiety. Isn't that? I want that. <laughs> you know, I want that in, in my church, but also in my life. I, wherever I am, I can influence through the power of the Spirit. David realized how much he needed and depended upon the Lord's presence in his life. It's not about words. <laughs> it's about the presence of God. Do you and I desire the presence of God more than anything else in our lives? Above watching England play Spain even. You're the good guys. You're all here this morning, so you're okay. okay. <laughs> Acts 3.19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So what does repentance bring? Times of refreshing. Oh boy. <laughs> I'd like a bit of that for sure. I'd like to be refreshed. I think we're all feeling a bit tired at times. I don't know about you, but I can relate to that. And there's only one place to be in the presence of the living God. Yes, revival is a sovereign act of God. We can't manufacture these things. We can't. We can't manufacture these things. It's as he wills. However, if you look at the history of revivals, I've noticed that revival doesn't happen unless three things happen. One, prayer. Two, penitence. And three, purity. Prayer, penitence, purity. As I said, revival is a sovereign act. But if you look at the history of revivals, it's amazing how those three things just come together. Number three, an unrepentant heart destroys our witness 
and our sharing of our faith. David cries out in verse 12 to 13, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. We cannot give out something that we have not received and are not practicing in our own lives. None of us want to be hypocrites, do we? We, And that's what David is talking about. He doesn't want to be a hypocrite before the Lord. He knows what's wrong in his life and it needs to be dealt with. And then he will share the good news of Jesus. Not, well, of God. Yeah, Jesus. For example, my father smoked all his life, right? And uh, one day he used to tell me this story. Right? He went to see his GP and uh, the doctor said to him, Mr. Thomas, you have to stop smoking. Give up smoking. That's fair enough, isn't it? Wise words. The only problem is that while the doctor was delivering these wise words, he was smoking a big fat Havana cigar and blowing smoke in my father's face. Times have changed, right? (laughs) But doctors smoked in their surgeries. I I can remember that. But was my father ever going to listen to this guy who was puffing smoke in his face? No. And likewise, are people going to listen to us if our lives don't stack up with what we're saying? Is that true? They won't. They want to see a genuine Jesus. That's all. We can all say the right things, can't we? And do the right things. But if our lifestyles are contrary, then it's a a tough ask. That's why David knew he had to repent, receive the Lord's forgiveness, and move on. It has been said that when Christians retreat, (laughs) evil steps up to fill the gap. No one can argue that this world is a mess, isn't it? It is a mess, come on, be honest. There's a lot of good things, you know, but it is generally a mess. And, but do you ever wonder why, when people are rejecting God and his moral laws, you know, and is it any wonder? And also, the church as well. Someone once said that there's too much of the world in the church and not enough church in the world. Think about it. And we pray for many things, don't we? And we'll be praying for many things in September. However, as I said, the greatest need, I believe, is to see this nation filled with the presence of God and his glory manifesting in our society, in our churches, in our communities, in our nation, in our government. Lord, help us. King David knew the glory of God and the transformation it had on the nation of Israel. And that's why in verse 18, he says, In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. His fall into sin as king would affect the whole nation. Our prayers can change a nation. Are we repenting for our nation at this time and praying? 2 Chronicles 7 says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek and face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. The Lord calls his people to repent and pray, not your next door neighbor. He calls us, the church. It's always been that way. Our prayer times give us a wonderful opportunity to cry out to the Lord, to heal families and communities and our nation. And repentance starts with us first. It might not be a hallelujah topic this morning, but it's true. It's true. Everything that the Lord says is true. The conviction of the Holy Spirit of our sins, and we all sin, is an active daily thing in our lives. 
Let me, I better throw this in as well. It's a wonderful truth that we are saved by grace, right? Not works, and that the Lord forgives us past, present, future sins. Jesus has dealt with it on the cross once and for all. It's been dealt with. However, it's a wonderful truth as well that we are called to a continual lifestyle of repentance through prayer as we face temptations daily. (laughs) Who doesn't face a temptation daily in this place? Whether it's in the office or whether it's uh, just walking the streets. We're all tempted daily. There's enough out there to tempt us. And none of us are perfect. These things are in the Bible to help us. It's our life jacket, as I said. Maybe you're, you're like me. This is my prayer in the morning, right? Well, it's, it's not mine, but it could be all of us. It says, Dear Lord, so far, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. (laughs) And from then on, I'm going to need a lot more help. (laughs) That's a good prayer, isn't it, every morning? Uh, I think I should start doing that. Psalm 51 is a great template for us, isn't it? A wonderful template of, of God's forgiveness that we can come back to. And gives us that little bit of extra help, you know. And as I finish, let's meditate on this. As David wrote, and as Keith Green sang, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That's the kind of prayer the Father never, never, never refuses to answer. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word, Lord. It is difficult. It is a difficult topic. But, Lord, you want us to have pure hearts before you. You want us to have the freedom of the Spirit, the joy of sharing our salvation with others, the joy of worship. And we don't want anything to hinder us, Lord, from that as church, as individuals. Lord, help us in our weakness, Lord, when we fall short of your glory. And I pray, Lord, that wherever we're at this morning as individuals, whether we've slipped up, messed up, and we do it all the time, Lord. We, you know us. We regularly mess up, slip up do things that you don't want us to do. But Lord, I know, I know from day one when I became a follower of yours that your forgiveness, your love, which is exemplary through the life of David, is there for me, is there for all of us this this morning. And I pray, Lord, for anyone who needs to draw on that forgiveness this morning, that that heartfelt brokenness before you. I pray they receive it this morning, Lord. Help me to receive your love this morning in a brand new way. Lord, we thank you again for your goodness, grace, and mercy towards us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.